Kingdom. Kingdom. Culture. Culture. Yes. God is. Amen. Go with me back to Matthew chapter 14. I tried to get you guys out of this storm, but uh, there is yet more that the Lord intends to say. By now, I'm sure you guys know this story by heart, but um, I feel like there's more for God to reveal. Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 22, reading from the New King James Version, it says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. Somebody say, Tharseo. It is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous. He was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Allow me to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. God, we thank you that you saw fit to give us another day. And so, God, we have decided not to squander the day that you've given us. So we, we thank you, God, that you gave us to strengthen our bodies to make it into this place called NTC. We thank you that we saw fit and we thought it valuable to join together with like believers. Father God, we thank you for technology that allows those of us that could not come out today to be able to fellowship with us digitally to receive what thus saith the Lord. So right now, God, I ask that I would decrease and you would increase. Touch my mouth. Place your words in it as you did with your prophet Jeremiah. God, I ask that what is spoken today would edify this body, but moreover, that it would glorify your name. We ask in this place, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would work as a translator. That what is spoken would be translated to be what it is that you are communicating to your people. We thank you for people that have come with a spirit of expectation. Those that woke up this morning and came into this place knowing that God was going to speak to them right where they are. Father God, we pray for those that are going through a storm even as we pray and preach. We ask that you would give them the confidence to know that they will indeed make it on the other side, God. That they would know that they are not the only ones going through a storm, God. But that they would also know that just like you were with the disciples in the midst of their storm, that you are with them in the midst of their storm and you will not leave them nor forsake them. We thank you, God, for being able to get to the other side. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Will you repeat after me? Say storms, thorns, thorns, thorns. and crosses. Um, if you if you will, I, I want to I want to remind you that where we left off last week, I shared with you that Jesus came to them and said, be of good cheer. And I shared that the Greek term that was used there that was translated to be of good cheer was tharseo. Will you say tharseo? And what tharseo in, it means is to be confident to be assured. And I share with you that what was amazing from my perspective, because sometimes people will tell you to cheer up, but they won't tell you why to cheer up. You, you have people that will tell you to be positive, but they won't tell you why to be positive. You have people that tell you it's gonna be okay, but they don't tell you why it's going to be okay. And so what I love that Jesus did is Jesus said, Tharseo, but he didn't just leave it as be, at, at be of good cheer. He tells them to be of good cheer because ego I me, it is I. 
And so the reason that you can be of good cheer, the reason you can be confident, Tharsaia, is because ego, I, me, it is I, meaning that you are in a storm. You are not delusional. It is not that you are not experiencing the turmoil that you believe you are experiencing. You're not crazy. There are wind and waves that are tossing you to and fro. There are dangerous conditions that are plaguing your journey. But Tharseo, be of good cheer. Ego, I, me, because it is I, meaning you're not by yourself in this, but I'm, I'm here with you. I told you that ego I me, although it was translated in the Greek, it was not the first time that you saw a phrase that resembled what it was that Jesus was articulating to the disciples. I told you that if you went back to Exodus chapter three, you will find that when Moses is speaking to the burning bush and he is being sent to the children of Israel, he asked, who is it that I should tell them is sending me, which is not merely who's sending me, but who's going to be with us as we go on this journey and God being a God that cannot be boxed in says I am that I am it was in this that I told you that you have to make sure that God is your everything always yeah yeah I, I like this because it was on this premise that I concluded that Jesus is telling the disciples in the midst of the storm to be of good cheer because God is everything always that sometimes we have to be reminded that we do not serve a God that can be boxed off sometimes we have to be reminded that the God that we serve can do anything except fail so he says I am that I am it is I because when you need help God says I am that I am when you need healing, God is saying, I am that I am. I'm healing. I am help. I am all sufficiency. I am everything you need always when you need it. I am. I am that I am. In other words, God is saying, as Paul communicated, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God is saying, I am that I am. Ego, I, me, it is I. God is everything always. Yeah. And so in Matthew chapter 14, verse 24, it says, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea tossed by the waves for the wind was contrary. If you've been listening to me for any portion of time, you will note that um, I enjoy defining words because I believe that defining words reveals context. And context can be described as detail that helps you to understand what is happening and why. Moreover, when you understand the meaning of a word, it gives purpose to its positioning in the statement in which you hear it. Will you say contrary? contrary. The Bible says that the wind was contrary. And what I've defined contrary as is opposing excuse me, opposite or opposing in nature. It is opposite or opposing in nature or meaning. Will you say against? See, whenever something or someone, because contrary doesn't only speak to winds, contrary speaks to people too. So, so whenever someone or something is contrary, it can also be categorized as being against. And something that is against can be categorized as being adverse. Have you ever heard the term adversary? The Bible says that the adversary is going to and fro. Like what? Like a roaring lion seeking who it may what? Eat up. You remember the old school would tell you this world would chew you up and spit you. Ah, y'all had some old school people. Contrary. See, I like that the word of God describes the wind as being contrary so that we understand that Jesus was sending them in one direction. Yet the winds of their storm was attempting because it was contrary to blow them in the opposite direction from where God was trying to send them. Y'all stand with me so far? See, it helps you understand that a component of your storm is going to be something that is contrary, adverse, 
or against the direction that God is trying to send you. It, it, was, it was right around here that I, I, I realized that when something is contrary, adverse, or against, it means that it is not working with you and it is not working for you, but it is intentionally trying to stop you from being or becoming from going or getting to where God is trying to manifest. And so an adversary can also be described as an opponent or an enemy. So when something is contrary, it is working to oppose you, it's going against you. And one of the most important lessons that we must learn in our lives is not only what, but who to listen to. We have to decide what and who does not deserve our time or our attention. And the reason I tell you that is because what and who you listen to becomes an influence. It doesn't even matter if you don't like what they're saying. What and who you listen to eventually becomes an influence. Which leads me to this point, if you're taking points. Will you write these words? Don't allow what's against you to convince you. Will you repeat it after me? Say, don't allow what's against you to convince you. See, I got to tell you that, uh, that, that I spent some time this week being poured into. And, and, and one of the quotes that I heard this week is that whoever has your ear has your future. Yeah, I was floored when I heard it. Because it was in consideration of this quote that I concluded that who you listen to convinces you. That, that, that who you listen to convinces you. And the Bible declares in Romans 10, 17, y'all know it well. That faith comes by hearing. And when taking that into perspective, it's what I hear that empowers the possibilities that I see as evident for my journey. See, you and I cannot afford to be convinced by what is contrary. That every word that we digest must be intentionally empowering our belief in God's ability to perform every miracle that we need on the journey that we're on. So when I hear, when I hear contrary words, I have to decide whether that was sent by God or sent by Satan. So what we hear must be geared towards our growth and trust that even in the darkest and deadliest of storms, God is still in control and that we will make it through. Can, can I tell you guys that our challenge is that we become consumed. <laughs> we become consumed with knowing what's contrary. Is it just me? Y'all ever been told that somebody was talking about you? What was your first question? What they say. <laughs> we have become consumed. We have become consumed with knowing about what's contrary. Somebody is saying something negative about you. And you want to know exactly if you like me. I want to know what they said. And then I want to know what you said. And then I want to know why they were comfortable saying it. Loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. I, just saying, we've become consumed with knowing what is contrary. See, but can I, can, can I, can I encourage you with this? I want you to write this down. Because the reason you cannot let what is against you convince you is because the enemy does not have as much power as you think. 
Get this. I want you to get this. The Bible declares in the 21st number of Psalm, verse 11, it says, though they plot evil against you and devise wicked schemes, meaning they got plans and ideas, they cannot succeed. One more time. Though they plot, meaning that they are sitting down, strategizing. You and I have always been taught that if you want a thing to be successful, what you have to do is be strategic. What this word is telling you is that those that are plotting against you can be as strategic as they want to be. It says, though they plot evil against you and devise wicked schemes, they cannot succeed. Meaning that their plot, this is what I want you to write down. I want you to write down that their plot has no power unless I participate. I, I need you to begin understanding that God has granted you such significant power over your own life and circumstances that when people are plotting evil schemes and plans against you, that the only way for the enemies to be successful in the plot that they have against you is if you decide to participate in their plot. What does that mean? That means that when I allow what is against me to convince me, I begin operating as if I have already been defeated. If someone tells me you're nothing and you'll never be successful, if I allow what is being spoken against me to convince me, I will stop striving at the level that I strive. When someone says I'm never going to be a homeowner, I stop envisioning the keys to the front door that I know that God desires for me to have. When somebody says I'm always going to be by myself, I stop envisioning a life where God sends them. Not I find them, but God sends them to me. And thus, because I stop operating according to faith, I began participating in the plot that is against me. I got it. I want you guys to see something. See, if I'm speaking to you this morning, say amen. amen. I appreciate y'all. Listen, I, I want you guys to see something, right? Because in, in, in Matthew 14, 28, it says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, I, I want to I place what, uh, what I describe as a parenthetical pause for the cause right here. And, and, and I need you to understand because I think it is only appropriate that we pause parenthetically to provide a profile of Peter. Yeah, yeah. So, and the reason y'all that's laughing know Peter. The reason I think it's appropriate is because often in our ignorance, we think that God only provides powerful purpose to perfect people. Can I say it again for you? Can, can I repeat it so you can tweet it? In our ignorance, we think God only provides powerful purpose to perfect people. But can I debunk the delusion? That because God positions you in powerful purpose does not mean that you are a perfect person. That you can have power and destiny and purpose and not be closer to perfect. So I want to give you, I want to give you a profile of Peter. Because other than Jesus, you and I cannot identify another individual that is perceived to have walked on water. Meaning that God not only called Peter, 
but he used Peter to do something miraculous. And if you and I are ignorant, we will assume that powerful purpose is only for perfect people. So if you will allow me to give you a profile of Peter. See, I need you to understand that Peter was the disciple that in Matthew 16, 16, it says, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This is when Jesus was asking the disciples, he was asking the disciples, who do men say that I am? And then because Jesus don't play, he switches it up. That's what they say. Who do you say that I am? And I love it because if you've heard me talk about it before, I don't believe that it's merely lip service. I think that when he's asking, who do you say that I am? He's also asking, what does your lifestyle say about me? How does the way that you treat people communicate your connection to Christ? But that's a different sermon for another time. And so when he asked, who do men say that I am? They began giving him answers, but then he made it personal. Who do you say that I am? And so this is where Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And what I love is Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. What Jesus does in this phrase is he affirms the fact that Peter was hearing from God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because what he says is, you didn't get that from none of these other jokers. Ain't nobody able to communicate that because they don't know that. And so what you just did is articulate for me. You just preached a message all by yourself, Peter, because flesh and blood couldn't have told you who I am. Only God could have told you that. And so I love it. I love it because you get a chance to see a profile of Peter. Peter was somebody in Matthew 16 that was hearing from God, receiving fresh revelation. If you got it, say amen. I need you to see something that, um, let's go down four verses if you don't mind. Uh, same, same exact conversation. Oh, I'm about to give you the profile of Peter. Peter who we know to have acted on the word of God, functioned on faith, walking on the water in the midst of a storm. Same Peter that is receiving fresh revelation from God, knowing that Jesus is the Christ. Y'all with me so far? Say amen. Four verses down. <laughs> It says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Do you, can you imagine? Oh, come on, somebody. You rebuked Jesus? Two chapters ago, walking on the water. Four verses ago, receiving fresh revelation. Five verses later, rebuking Jesus? He says, it says, he began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, that this shall happen to you. And he turned, this is Jesus, and he turned and said to Peter, in the same chapter, oh my goodness, you got to read your Bible. Uh, you can't make this stuff up. We was just in a conversation. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter. You hear from God, my brother. To get thee behind me, Satan. You offended me, Peter. Same Peter that walked on the water. Same Peter that heard from God. Same Peter that rebuked Jesus. Same Peter that was called Satan. All the same person. Can I help you to understand that God does not provide powerful purpose? 
to perfect people. Peter is also the disciple that when Jesus was arrested, he drew his sword and he cut off the ear. I got to show it to you in scripture because you don't believe it. Matthew 26, 51 says, and suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. That's what Matthew said about it. Mark said in 1447, Mark says, and one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Luke says in 2250, and one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And John, though. Oh, you got to have a John, too. John is the same disciple. If you was here a few resurrection Sundays ago, I share with you, John's the same gospel that described the fact that he beat Peter in a foot race. I don't know if you saw when they were going back to the tomb. He said the disciple whom Jesus loved beat the other disciples to the. You don't want to read your Bible. John, though. John, let me tell you, one of the things I like about John, and I'm, I'm going to give it to you. One of the things I like about, you got it up here? Is it up there yet? Put it up there. One of the things I like about John, John say names. Oh, listen to me. No disrespect. No disrespect if this is the type of person you are. But I don't respect subliminals. I don't do subliminal. You can't never, you ain't never going to be able to make something, say something, do something that you did not at me. You got to say my name, baby, or you ain't talking to me. I like John because John say names. The other disciples said one who was with G. Somebody standing by. It was one of the jokers that was there. John? John? John don't just, when I read it to you, John don't just tell you who cut it. He tell you who he cut. He say names you don't even care about. You. It's a, he gave that man a whole government. Y'all need his social security. I don't know if you, how much you need to know about him. The word of God in John 18, 10 says, then Simon Peter having a sword, he was armed and dangerous, drew it. And struck the high priest servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. <laughs> Listen, if there was anybody more conditioned to be a witness, you can be a witness for the Lord. Do you understand me? John was like, I got all the tea. It's a profile of Peter. I want you to notice something, though. Because if you remember, when we started talking about this story of Peter walking on the water, I share with you that the Gospels all gave an account of what happened in that storm. But of all of them, only Matthew talked about what Peter did in walking on the water. I want you to notice that all four of the Gospels talk about the exact same instance. Can I tell you that sometimes people will minimize your miracle and emphasize your errors? You, you, you better come to grips with it. You, bet, you better settle in and resolve the fact that all four of these gospels were not willing to magnify the miracle of Peter walking on the water, but they had no problem emphasizing the error of him cutting off an ear. When he did a thing that nobody else was willing to do, that nobody had the confidence or the faith to walk out the way that Peter did it, Mum's the word. You ain't got nothing to say when I'm being powerful and purposeful. But when I get beside myself, 
When I allow my flesh to rise up in me, now you got the account. You know all the tea when it's about me doing what's wrong, but you don't know nothing about me doing what's right. Where they do that at? John, where was all this detail when I was putting one foot in front of the other walking towards Jesus? Do you know people that come into your life to bond with you over your brokenness? Do, 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 do you know people that come into your life and all we have to celebrate is what it is that I've sacrificed? The, the only thing you want to talk about is who I used to be and what I used to do and the errors I used to make. You got nothing to say about my journey towards Jesus, but you got everything to say. Hey, you know that Peter, you swing a sword. I, I guard your ears, y'all, guard your ears. You got to wear muffs around Peter, cause you know. Don't be surprised when people minimize your miracles and emphasize your errors. Don't, don't be discouraged when people prioritize pinning your pitfalls, but somehow overlook your ability to overcome your obstacles. Can I give you this? Will you look at somebody and say, God knows? See, see I, I need you to understand that for many of us, we want other people to give an account to our accolades. We desire acceptance so bad that we struggle when we do right and nobody recognizes. One more time, tell your neighbor, God knows. See, it's important to know that God knows and sees all. And it's important to know that because God knows all and sees all, that because God is seeing all is why he can be confident in knowing your value and your heart. I want you guys to see something. See, people will define you by stage. So the stage they catch you in, they will encapsulate you to. They will confine you to the stage they found you in. Hear me out. And when that's the case, they'll never be able to receive the true value of the call that God has placed on your life because they still see you as you were 20 years ago. Can I tell you one of the things that encouraged me a few weeks ago, uh, my sister Angela, she made a post about pastor appreciation. And, uh, and she, she, she did two things she doesn't even know that she did. One, she used a picture of me a little more overweight. <laughs> did y'all see that? Yeah, it was Transformation Tuesday for me. Uh, <laughs> I looked at that, I said, wow. <laughs> Some things have changed. She said I was beautiful, I love you baby, thank you. She said I was beautiful, amen. She did two things for me. One, she allowed me to see a physical transformation. But two, she articulated a spiritual transformation. Because in it, she talked about having conversations with me when I was 13 years old. If Angela was the type of person that because she met me in a stage allowed me to be captive to the stage she found me in, she would not be able to call me pastor. Because at the time she describes, she was the spiritual leader to me. The beauty is you will not have many Angelas. You will have far more people that will identify you based on the stage of your transition. 
so they never get to see the beauty of your transformation. And so you, you have to learn to be okay with the fact that if nobody knows, God knows. God knows my value. And God knows my heart. Now, I also want you to understand something because sometimes we will say God knows my heart as a way of excusing bad behavior. I don't want you to walk out of here say, you know, Pastor Kevin said God knows my heart. Uh, he does. Um, and he's concerned about how you're using that phrase. <laughs> he's very concerned that that's what you're using as a way. But he knows. I want you to understand God knowing your heart the way I am talking about it is helping you to identify the fact that God knows because the word of God says the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Meaning that nothing is more deceitful than your heart. So when you say God knows my heart, it communicates God sees value even through the thing that is most wicked and disgusting and flawed about me. God knows my heart means that although there are things in it that are stony and prickly that require surgery in order to get through, he knows me well enough to say, yeah, but when I cut through everything that is disgusting, when I trim away all of the things that don't need to be there, there is far more good in it than the bad. Tell somebody God knows. I want you, I want you guys to see. I want you guys to see this because, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to try, try to do this in a short period of time. Check this out. I want you to understand not to be traumatized when people try to trap you in your trouble. Many people will want to define you by your difficulty, but what God is doing through you just takes time to reveal. So, so don't be discouraged. Instead, be diligent. Don't, don't be confused, but instead stay consistent because the fact, the fact that you are broken does not mean God is not building. Some I saw, um, some I saw online some time ago. Um, it, it said, um, "Broken crayons still color." Will you, will you minister to somebody that might need it? Will you repeat after me? Say, "Broken crayon." Look at somebody though. Say, "Broken crayons still color." I, I want you, I want you, I want you to look at somebody other than who you just looked at, and I want you to say this too. I want you to say, "Flawed diamonds have value." Can I, can I, I want to end with this. I want to end with this. I have so much more to tell you on this story, but I, but I want to end with this. Speaking of flawed diamonds, because I learned some things about diamonds that I did not know, that I feel like is encouraging for the journey that you and I are on. I learned that diamonds are assessed by something that is called four C's. Are you familiar with four C's? It, it is, they are, they are assessed by four C's. Carrot, which is the weight. They're, they're assessed by carrot, cut, color, and clarity. If you with me, say amen. Yes. The most valuable diamonds are flawless diamonds. And the reason that the most valuable diamonds are flawless diamonds is because flawless diamonds are so rare. Oh, I'm speaking to somebody already. But I learned something that might encourage you. See, I learned that flaws are essentially, when it comes to diamonds, a unique quality that proves the diamond is not perfect. But get this, a flawed diamond can often make a diamond more valuable because it authenticates the stone. 
Stay with me. The flaw proves that the diamond is not perfect. But the flaw also proves and authenticates that it is Stick with me. See, I, I need you to understand that a flaw can prove the authenticity or that the diamond is real and not fake. But get this, some flaws, according to experts, some flaws are preferred over flawless because often a flaw on a diamond can draw attention to the diamond's true beauty. I hope you can get this. Some flaws can draw attention to the diamond's true beauty, thus increasing its value. Can I bring it home? The flaws that you have authenticate the fact that you're not Jesus. The flaws you have authenticate that you are really you. That you are not a carbon copy of somebody else. Sharita, if you didn't have flaws, you wouldn't be Sharita. You would be like every other person that does not have a unique character trait that makes them authentic can I tell you that the flaws that you seem to struggle with are the very things that God may be leveraging in order to draw attention to the true beauty of your testimony and the fact that he does not merely provide perfect people with powerful purpose but instead, he is able to utilize broken crayons to illustrate the picture of the purpose that he provides. And so I, I pray that you can embrace that. I say that to you not that you waddle in flaws, but that you understand that the things about me that are even not so perfect that God is using those things too. That, that the fact that I am not perfect does not mean I don't have value or purpose. But instead, it means that my value and my purpose are very specific and unique to me. And so don't be discouraged when everybody is not drawn by your flaws. Don't, don't be discouraged when everybody does not find your imperfect, imperfection is valuable. Yeah. But instead, remind yourself, God knows who he created in me, what he created me for, and who he called me to. Will you stand with me real briefly? Before we have our announcements and before, and, and before we raise the offering for those that, have been, uh, that has been placed on your heart to give, I want to make sure that I take a moment to extend the salvation of Jesus to somebody in this room and somebody that's watching online. So hopefully we have not stopped the broadcast yet. But I want to make sure that I extend salvation of Jesus to you because I don't want to assume that because you're here or because you tuned in that that automatically means that you're in relationship with Jesus Christ. Here at NTC, I explain that receiving the salvation of Jesus is as simple as ABC. A is admit, B is believe, and C is confess. Here at NTC, we say the prayer of salvation collectively so that if there is anybody under the sound of my voice, they will know that they are not isolated, but that they are joining a larger family in Christ Jesus. If you will, I'm going to ask that you trust me enough to repeat after me. Will you say, I admit, I admit that, I sinned, that I have sinned and I'm in need, I'm in need of, a of a Savior? I believe, I believe Jesus, Christ Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Is the Son of God that he died for my sins and was resurrected with all power in his hands. I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord 
my Savior. Put your hands together for somebody that may have said it for the first time. You may be seated. 